Mboa is a Nigerian author of the recent god punk novel, David Mogo, God Hunter. His shorter works have appeared in Lightspeed, Tor.com, Strange Horizons, and Fireside, and other periodicals and anthologies. He lives in Lagos, Nigeria, and Tucson, Arizona, where he teaches undergraduate creative writing while completing his MFA. Please welcome C. introduce you to the concept as a whole. Um, just give me a second. Okay, here it is. Um, so, as a, for the summary of the book, pretty much David, the title of a character, um, being a demigod in a place where um, gods are falling to, you know, the city, and he sort of like have to deal with both being human and being um, a god, and the friction between both parties. Um, sets him up to pretty much introduce us to the worlds of both. So, the first scene, I'm going to introduce you to a god called Shango. Um, so Shango is pretty much um, the is is um, the Yoruba version of Thor. It's the god of th uh, thunder, uh, and he's also the brother in this book to the uh, major villain. Um, and this scene is about David coming home. He lives with his foster. Um, grandfather who's also a wizard and uh, a young girl who they rescued in one of their trips uh, and he comes to this house his house their house is called Cardoso house uh, it's it's a it's it's a afro brazilian architecture um, there, there's like on the coast of west africa and on the coast of the south america there, there there was a lot of like cross pollination during the um, slave trade so there's a heavy uh, presence of Brazilian and Portuguese influence on the coast of Nigeria. So, um, so you you hear me mention Cardoso House a lot, and so so much so that some of these houses are like titled. You'd, you'd walk around some parts of Lagos and you see a house just saying Cardoso House. Um, it's just like harking back to the uh, South American um, slaves who were brought over and who built this uh, these parts of the estate. Okay. So this is, um, I'm going to start with the fire already on in the scene, right? The house is on fire. That's basically the setup. Heat presses down on me from above. The back of my neck is a hot place. My eyebrows feel like they will peel any moment. Smoke swirls in my ears, my mouth, my nose, my eyes. I'm coughing, tearing my lungs as I clamber up the stairs, careful not to touch anything metallic. Flames below on the balcony, smoke and tears blinding me so I must blink, blink, and still not see my hand in front of me, feeling my way up the corridor. I struggle to extend my esper, see if I can reach with my consciousness and touch the rooms around me, locate Payu and Fatih. But I'm still half human. My senses are dulled, useless. 
overpowered by the stench of burning wire and foam. Another boom, thunder rolling with menace. The hallway upstairs illuminates for a second as lightning zags about outside. And in that brief flash of light, I see them. Payu huddled above Fatih at the end of the corridor, the window behind them framing their stricken, frightened poses. The flames keep them in that spot, bursting out of the doors in front of them, feeling the stretch between them and I. The floorboards are burnt through, and there is a black, smoking chasm opening up before me. Their eyes register my presence, but there's something else there. Payus, wide and filled with horror, Fatih bearing the glazed look of Ibeji coming to the fore. They're looking in my direction, all right, but not fixed on me, past me, behind me. There is a sparkle, a snap, the pop of something materializes behind me. I get a jolt, an impression of brilliance goddesses that puts the sum total of all my impressions today to shame. A thrumming white vibrance in this hell of yellow, a blast of ice heat in this inferno. I turn, and in front of me, standing at close to seven feet, is the biggest, meanest Arisha I've ever seen in my entire life. His robes, thick, mottled, ripping here and there into fire, silver and blue lightning running crackling fingers around it, never burning. Translucent materialized god skin shimmers, the brown of Ramallah. Muscles sculpted by divine hands. A superimposed dwarf statue with a hammerhead and a thick crosshatched beard flutters about the god in an after image. An overpowering knot odor of bitter cola rises off him despite the smoke. In his hand, a double headed axe, its surface gleaming in the light of fire, thunderstone, sparkles of lightning caressing it, running fingers around it, pleasing it. His eyes, swirling pools of ashe fire of the gods, essence of divinity. He lifts the axe, points it at me, and a voice like many cannons blasting in sync says, you. The air between Yorisha and I first stiffens, gathers. There is the overpowering smell of electricity, like a steel cable heating up and getting ready to spark, as if the air particles are rubbing against themselves and charging up for something. My tongue tastes like a narrow coin. Physics. I think, right before the bolt of electricity leaves his ass and comes for me. I've ducked from a lot of things in my life. Bullets, hurled weapons, punches, and all kinds of blows. Even a couple of charm casts, yes? But man, it's lightning fucking fast. <laughs> the bolt strikes me clean in the left shoulder before I can shift a foot. Something bursts in my shoulder and pain scatters through me, shooting fire into every blood vessel. The left side of my body goes numb. My eyelid droops almost so I can't see through that eye. My knee buckles. I go down, breaking my paw with a palm on the floor. My arm responds with a chorus of pain, and my heart's rhythm changes, fibrillates, panic. I can't seem to remember anything that happens after the act, except thinking, damn, I wish I had my knife. The big Orisha sails, do right, like right lightning, like a stair kick, and then he's before me, his axe right in front of my eyes, and I see feathered touch on the bridge of my nose. I push out a weak esper reaching out to read his signature, nausea threatening to drown me. You know who I am, that voice I can't say. Yes, I say to myself, the signature coming back with the response. Yes, you are Shango. Yes, he says, as if reading my thoughts. Remember me when you cross to the afterlife. Then the air in front of my face burns and gathers electricity. Thank you. Um, so this second, um, sorry, give me a second. The second deity is called um, Oloku. Um, sorry about that. Um, so Olokum is uh, the water deity, the water deity that comes from the Yuba pantheon, but also manages to be one of those gods that cuts across a lot of the pantheons including those from other parts of Nigeria, like where I'm from. I'm from the south of Nigeria, from a tribe called Edo, and Olokum is also, also features in, um, in my um, pantheon, right? Um, so much so that um, my name, Okungwawa, actually means, uh, 
the sea has come home. And the word for sea or water bodies in that name means is Okun, and, and Olokun actually means ruler of the waters, right? Or God over the waters. And so in uh, one of the biggest um, things that has come out from this is um, in, in, in different pantheons, Olokun is represented as either male or female, depending on what pantheon, and there's always this argument about if Olokun is male or female. And one of the things I really wanted to do was to actually treat this um, deity as what it would be, what, what they would be best represented as, which is non-binary. And, and that, w that was the thing I really wanted to do well. And this is a scene where David, after being defeated by Shango, obviously, <laughs> um, is rescued by a fishing community that manages to be the one community that has been untouched by all of the destruction going on in Lagos. And the reason for that is because Olokun is actually protecting that community. And so you know, Olokun gets to decide if give David gets to stay or leave. And that's what the scene is about. Uh, David is sent over to go see this god. The water moves suddenly, yet it takes me a while to notice it, mostly because it moves without knowing. It's dark, yet I can still see a shadow below the surface, waiting, almost pondering the way shark contemplates before snapping up its prey. They say you want to see me, I say. I'm here. Then the god below the surface rises, slowly, and stands in the water. Their dreadlocked hair is held up in different places with seaweed, decorated with periwinkle, cowrie shells, and water stones, which grow translucent in a myriad of blues, greens, turquoises, opals. Their skin reflects the water stones, smooth and silky, but not at all wet looking which messes with my eyes a bit. They are lean, with muscle-toned limbs that tell of a warrior life path, now withered like a retired soldier. They stand at waist level in the water, wrapped in green cloth at the torso and chest, swaying as if dancing with the waves. Their eyes are pure white, they are shed, alive and kicking, yet there is a look of fatigue in them, of someone who has seen many things and fought many battles and loved hard and cared hard and eventually gotten tired of the world. I know that look because I've seen it in Bambaoji many times. The god signature flashes across my consciousness, the beauty of sunset and waterfalls, the smell of raw incense, the sound of water from a fountain, a bell pinging underwater, a chalice, big and beautiful and royal, made for wealth alone, wine drunk from this chalice, the back of my tongue tasting of grapes, but also of fish, a bleak day of mist and fog, but which is really a dream the cry of a big fish calling to its mates underwater. I reach out, heady with nausea, pushing my goddess in, asking the signature questions of its origin. Oloku, I say, when the answer comes back. They cock their head in that jerky motion that only birds and fish have. A membrane slides over their eyes and disappears again, a fleeting fish blink. Orisha Daji, Oloku says. Their voice is clear, but with a wobble underneath, as if speaking underwater. Yes, I say. I guess that's me. You are not welcome here, Olokun says, speaking sweetly but firmly. Like my primary school teacher saying, stretch out your hand, darling. Stretch out your hand. <laughs> that much has been made known, I say. Olokun fish kings again, cocks their head, as if saying, so are you going to leave or not? Are you going to attack me? I ask. Kick me out? They seem to contemplate it for a bit. No. Well, I assume you wanted to see me for a reason then. They rise completely out of the water, and I see that they have no legs at all, but large, suffered octopus tentacles, sculling themselves through the water with the tips, like snakes dangling their tails over the edge of a pool, swishing without sound. They sail forward and stop a few feet in front of me. I hear you defeated the fire, the, fi the first vessel the fiery ones brought forth, Olokan says, scrutinizing me like a rare specimen their head twitching here and there. Well, yeah, I guess, why do you care? You were attacked, they say, sniffing the air. I smelled Shongo's bolts all over you once you arrived in my settlement. Yes. Which means they will come here for you soon. They will come here and they will lay these people and everything here to waste, as they did on Oru. If you care about these people, you must leave. Uh-huh. They fish blink. Death and destruction follow everywhere you go, Orisha Daddy. Well, what the fuck does that mean, though? I say, my voice rises to puncture the night stillness. 
Why do you all keep saying that, as if I am the one bringing all the death and destruction? <laughs> I wave at them. Seriously, aren't you guys the problem? Stack your own home, came down here, messed up our very nice slice of the world, then you want to pin it on me? Me who has literally done everything I can to fix your mistakes, to make life better for everyone down here. Me who has lost everything I care about in this world because of you guys. I slam my fist on the handrail. You should be the one to get out of here. These people don't need you. It is you who need them for sustenance, who feeds on their worship and sacrifice to relieve your wasted away glory days on Oru or whatever. I'm coming for all of you, especially those fiery ones. My breathing is agitated by the time I'm done, but Boloko hasn't flinched, just blinking at me quizzically with maybe a hint of sorrow in that stare. I'm sorry for what you have lost. Fuck, you're sorry, I say. <laughs> Can't you all just leave us alone? <laughs> they will never leave you alone, Oloka said, looking away from me for the first time. The fiery ones do not take the threats kindly, and you have waged war against them. They have proven this in our room, and they will prove it here. They will come for you, and everyone and everything around you, until all is ash and dust, and only then will they rest. So I'm, I'm just going to quickly give you the third um, god, introduce the third god, which is um, Eshu, right? Um, so when, when, the, when the, um, the missionaries came to West Africa, uh, I think, okay, when the missionaries came to West Africa and uh, the Bible was introduced, um, it, for the first time it was translated to Yoruba by, okay, by um, Bishop Ajay Crowder, and there was no word for the devil in Yoruba. Right, um, in Yoruba cosmology. So uh, one of the things that happened was that they struggled for a word to explain, to, to represent the devil, and they ended up using Eshu because that was the most malevolent god in the pantheon of Yoruba land, which is kind of sad. Um, but Eshu isn't really, was never really the devil, and one of the things I wanted to do here was to represent Eshu as he probably really is, which is a trickster, pretty much like, say, Loki, right? Um, is just a trickster god who's like a really, you know, ridiculous dude. So, um, so in this part, um, David and his, t uh, his, everyone around him are trying to like find what which gods haven't joined the other faction and can like they can like recruit them for their own faction. And Eshu is one of those gods, and this is how this is when they meet Eshu. Um, you will hear me mention a, a number of other gods, which by this part of the book I might have introduced, but you can just um, gloss over that. Our next target meets us at the airport runway in the wee hours of morning, away from the prying eyes of the terminal. As Isla pulls out his chalk, draws a line on the tarmac, speaks some words in another arcane god tongue, then steps across it and is gone. We wait one, two, three minutes, then he reappears on our side of the line, and someone is with him. Eshu is the picture of the biblical angel. His skin is so fair it's almost white and his hair in, is in large, kinky curls. Even his eyebrows are white. And everything combines to make the ashe in his eyes so bright, you almost have to squint when you look at his face. Radiant is the word. He's dressed in an all-white robe with a, without a speck of dust, cinched around the waist with a golden belt. His feet are bare and unsoiled. He is perfect in every way, except for one tiny thing. He looks exactly like a mirage like a mirror reflection without a subject. He is either an old man or a young boy, or both at the same time. It almost feels as if his identity is a choose-your-own-adventure game where you decide what you're seeing. As one, we slightly bow our heads and greet him with the praise song Ogun has taught us. The god throws his head back and laughs long, hard. It's a striking laugh, literally like the clatter of metal sheets in heavy wind. If he were completely human, spittle would have flown out of his mouth and he would have held his chest and gasped. But he laughs and laughs without taking a breath, and the longer his, the laughter lasts, the longer the winds beat against zinc in our ears, the more goosebumps rise from our skin. When he finally winds down, he looks at Ogun. You know, he says, and when he speaks, there's a whiff of black pepper in the air. All the humans amongst us blink. Good, you know, but without the right enunciation, what a loss, eh? 
Ogun was right. I don't like this guy at all. He thinks of bad news and laughs, laughs like a fucking psychopath. <laughs> but what was I expecting? This is one of 266 iterations of Eshu, the god of pathways and manifestations, Orun's version of Aziza. This guy is not a person. He's an it, a thing, a hologram. He cannot be trusted. The tricksters are very tight across pantheons. Even though Aziza warned us never to use the word trickster to openly describe any single one of them. And Aziza was the first to offer the news that Eshu hadn't yet joined any side. He seemed like a clear fit for Agonju's army. So we wondered if he already joined but was only faking to get into our ranks. We wanted to meet him fully armed, but Aziza pushed against it vehemently. And now we're standing right in front of him, open to his pocket full of deceit. We welcome you, Ogun says without expression. We come in nothing but peace. Sure, he says, very sensible thing to believe, coming from a god of war, and he turns to me, studies me for a second, and another god of war, how many of you are there? <laughs> Nobody responds. Well, at least if you're going to welcome me, you should come without weapons. He raises his hand, and there is Papa Udi's now Fatumata's long hand, knife in his hand. Fatih, who's standing next to Ibedi, gasps, then reaches behind her and pulls, Papa Udi's knife from the band of her trousers. Ha! As she says, I giggle. The knife in his hand disintegrates before her eyes. Caught you, he says. But his face grows dark. Taiwo slowly pulls the knife out of her hand, and she lets go reluctantly. You know why we called you, Ogun says, impervious to his antics. Yes, he says. And I'm here to tell you, without any hesitation whatsoever, that I am ready to join your cause. We look at one another. Now that's unexpected and not worrisome. Not worrisome at all. <laughs> Why? I ask. What, what do you get out of this? And she regards me properly for the first time, and I realize I can't stare at him too long. His dwarf face creeps me out, and the whiteness hurts my eyes. What if I told you I have nothing to gain or lose? Then we are done here, I say. Thank you, Aziza. David, my mother says softly. Nope, I say, I don't like this guy. Coming in here, trying to shit on all of us. I point at him. I'm not fucking scared of you, you hear me? Go and join Agonju if you like. I will see you there and I will rip you to pieces. <laughs> David, Papa Rudy says, easy. And she has a smile on his face. And then he laughs again, clapping his hands. Now this is who I want to be on the side of. But you know what Agonju and his lot lack? Creativity, like you. Is this a joke to you? Kainde says. Everything is just a game to you, Aishu, isn't it? He shrugs, shows his palms. Nature, Kende, you can't, you can't fight it. Ogun gives, us all of us, gives all of us the eye, and we calm down. She returns her attention to Aishu. Fine, we will need one more thing from you then. Show us how you can help us, and that you mean good. <laughs>